I'm ready. Good morning, everybody. Once again. So we have a next session of MassCon. At the outset, I'd like to congratulate Professor Lahane, Ragini, uh, Sumit, and the entire team of uh, uh, Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society for organizing such a wonderful program. Going bang on time is the key for this program. So let's get started. We have some wonderful speakers with us. And my co-chairman, Dr. Jeevan Tetiyal, S.B. Kelkar, Dr. Nilesh Pandey, Ragini, of course, is here. So without wasting the time, let's start the uh, uh, first. Uh, okay, okay. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just start off. Okay. Okay. I uh, took up this topic to show you all how we can do uh, glued IOL scaffold in uh, difficult situations like this. So what I'm going to show you here is actually a white ring, which is uh, present behind the iris. These are the animations for the same. And I just want to explain to you with animation how we do a glued eye uh, scaffold in this case. You saw me creating scleral flaps. Then we saw, you saw the uh, 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 fluid inside the eye. Then uh, I took a glued oil with uh, making a 2.8 millimeter incision. And this is before I could, I could even take out the somering ring. Somering rings, I want to explain to you, are nothing but these are remnants of the cortical remnants uh, of the uh, lens, which had been removed earlier, let's say about 20, 30 years ago. These are uh, removed by surgeon and uh, they, they become calcified and later on they go uh, behind the iris. Started by somebody, the term was started by somebody way back in 1828, and he named it a somering. Dr. Somering named it a somering ring, which writes behind the iris. It may not affect the pupil because center of the pupil is very, very clear. But these patients, after so many years, have been started uh, to come to us either by referral or uh, our own patients who've been operated earlier, let's say by my mother-in-law or someone like that. So uh, what I'm planning to do in this case is, do a glued IOL scaffold. The name scaffold, I uh, call it, we call it actually named by Dr. Amaris. Here you can see me putting a trocar cannula just behind the limbus and then creating scleral flaps 180 degree apart using the epsilon um, uh, uh, flap marker uh, started by Ashwin. I have no financial interest, as I said in the beginning. You can see here, see me here doing a glued IOL with the ring present there by using the MST forceps, in, uh, using a 2.8 millimeter incision, a three-piece intraocular lens, holding on to the haptic tip, very important, haptic tip and externalize the haptic through the sclerotomy, created 0.5 to one millimeter behind the limbus after creating a 22 gauge sclerotomy. You can see the 22 gauge sclerotomy on the right-hand side now. This is the trailing haptic using the handshake technique, hold on to the tip of the haptic is very important because if you hold anywhere else, by the time you come out, the haptic may be deformed. Using a 26 needle, we created intrascleral pockets, which we call it chariot tunnels, started by Gabor chariot in Germany. Now I'm trying to dislocate the somering ring. These are white things which are lying behind the iris. These are nothing but they are cortical remnants after the uh, procedure like fukasa or needling or decision for myopia or even trauma in which the center part of the nucleus has been removed by needling or decision and the uh, cortical remnants start uh, becoming fibros and they get adherent to the remnants of the capsule. So here you can see me putting iris hooks to visualize it nicely. Take a vitrectomy and break this additions and bring the somering rings which are nothing but uh, remains of the cortex uh, uh, done earlier by uh, earlier surgeon and then left behind and using a phaco emulsification probe because these are very uh, dense and they will not come with the vitrector. So I'm doing that with a phaco emulsification probe. By doing the scaffold, the idea is I have created a platform of my own uh, to see that these rings do not fall into the vitreous cavity. Without this support, if I do this, it has gone behind the iris now but the lens is there to hold it on. So scaffold is nothing but you create your own platform so that you these uh, segments, segments do not fall behind. 
So you have to break these additions with the vitrector, go to the periphery using the two hand, the rod or the MSG forceps is holding on to the ring so it does not fall back. Did a little bit of vitrectomy to break the addition then using the phaco emulsification probe, remove these uh, rings or the white uh, segments which are uh, soma ring segments. Now you have to see that the pupil comes back to normal I had already tucked the, uh, uh, tucked the haptics behind using the fibrinogen uh, 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 thrombin combination, glue the scleral flaps, glue the conjunctiva. This is called fibrin glue, which is nothing but tissue glue, which is uh, manufactured by a company called Baxter in Germany. You can use this glue for at least five to six cases if you open one. It comes in two vials in a combination of fibrinogen thrombin. I've closed all the holes which I've created to put my iris hooks to visualize it better. This is a, a patient post-operatively one month with the vision of 2020. Here you can see the pupil is a little bit dilated. This is an old video. If it was done now, I would have even done an SFT, uh, single pass fourth throw pupilloplasty and made the pupil small and make it uh, look even much better. So having said that, I completed my uh, presentation. Ragini said only eight minutes, madam. So I finished it. Now we can go back to the meeting again. Uh, ma'am, uh, now the Krasna Kumar Kudlu wants to go uh, because okay. his son no, is admitted. No problem. So we can invite him. He can, he can go. Come on. Come on. Oh, yeah. Dr. Krishna Prasad. Let me just you have to up. stop sharing, madam. You are. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop sharing, yes. Yeah. Thank you, madam. Krishna, how are you? Uh, I am fine, madam. I am fine. How are you, madam? Karnataka is in a bad shape after Puneet's uh, death. Yeah, yeah, bad shape, madam. But uh, now hopefully you know on. it yes. should recover, madam. Okay. Uh, now, thank uh, you so uh, much. Yeah. Can you so can everybody see my presentation? PCR. What next is your topic, sir? Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you, MOS. Very thank important you. topic. Everybody gets this at one time or the other. So. You should know yeah. how to manage. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ragini Didi. Thank you, Lahane, sir, and the whole MOS for this oh, oh, opportunity. I am always indebted to Mara Soft and Mix Society. This is my talk, management of post capsular tear. I don't have any financial interest for this talk. So definition, post capsular tear can be defined as a hydrogenic breach in the continuity of the post capsule. Incidence is around 1 to 4%, but it's largely depend upon the equipment, setup, and surgeon's experience and skill. So once you notice the PCR, what you have to do? Early recognition is very important. What are the signs? First, sudden deepening of the entry chamber with momentary dilatation of the pupil. Sudden transitory appearance of the cleared red reflex peripherally. The nucleus piece was moving around easily. Now suddenly there will be stop in the free movement of the lens, the nucleus within the back. And excess, huh. even sometimes excess tipping of the one pole of the nucleus. So what to do? Response. As soon as you notice the PT rent, PT rent stop working. Do not withdraw the phaco instrument. Go back to foot position one. Maintain the chamber stability. Fill the anterior chamber through the side port by injecting a dispersive viscoelastic. Then withdraw the phaco tip. Assess the situation. Inspect, relax, and think. So some of the easier way to know about vitreous in the AC chamber like spawn test, sweep test, halo test, and stain test. I will not be talking much about this. So what is the management? Now surgeon must decide whether to continue with the FACO or convert into non-FACO technique. Once again, it depends upon the amount of nucleus remaining, the density of the nucleus, and other accompanying factors like small people lose zonules. So what should be our goal? Avoid posterior dislocation of the nucleus or nucleus fragment or epinucleus or cortical matter into the vitreous cavity. Prevent damage to the coronal endothelium prevent enlargement of the tear, prevent damage to the capsular axis, remove of leftover cortex, maintain wound size, in the end proper positioning of the intraocular lens. So here I'm just showing you one of the old video of one of my friend. See here you can see here, the, the phaco emulsification is performing very well. Yes, sir. And you can see in the end of the surgery, you can see there is a small rent here. 
See, the last piece, I think probably the surgeon was very aggressive. I have taken from my friend, Dr. Satyamurthy from Hubli. So there is small rent. So that time, go back to foot position one, put to some amount of viscous elastic. In these cases, you can still do a dry aspiration. Then you can, if you are a very good surgeon, you convert it, this small rent into posterior capsular axis, then you can still implant a three-piece lens within the back. So impending nucleus drop, always one point I want to tell you, do not try to chase the descending fragment into phaco. If you do a phaco in the vitreous cavity, there is a chances of creating a giant retinal tear. So there are two important techniques I think managed, who has been described. One is described by chopstick technique by our friend Dr. Arbans Lal, or PAI, that is a posterior assisted levitation by the Dr. Kelman. But uh, I think uh, what we, they do in PAL through the pars planar, viscoid is inject, and with the help of 26 gauge needle or thin cannula, the, eye, the nucleus is pushed forwards. But one important technique already Atiya Madam told, which has been described by our great friend Dr. Amar Agrawal, none other than this IOL scaffold, where IOL itself will act as a uh, to prevent the nucleus to go down. See, this is the one video I picked from one of my friends. You can see here, there is already rent is there. Already IL has been put, but just see that nucleus piece is behind the intraocular lens. The surgeon is trying to fishing around, the nucleus is not coming out. So why I'm showing you, this is a, both the case of IL scaffold along with the PAL, that is a posterior levitation of the intraocular lens. If you get this nucleus over the IOL, the IOL itself acts as a scaffold, then you can finish with the fake emulsification. Now convert into the manual technique. This is the one video I'm just showing you. See black nucleus tried by one of my friend's surgeon. Suddenly he could able to see sudden deepening of the lens, but he is not so confident of SICS. But his may, our job to mainly get this black nucleus out, converting into a regular ECC. There is no ego behind this. Rather, in the end, our surgery has to be completed and nucleus, the IOL has to be put. This is a one more case with the black, brown nucleus. When you're trying, you could be able to see a sudden deepening of the anteric chamber. That means there is already rent is there. Convert into SICF. Then make almost around 6.5 to 7 mm tunnel. Then in, uh, increase the rexis, then get the nucleus into the entry chamber, sort of a railroad technique with a minimal manipulation so that you will not be damaging any zonules. Well, some of our friends even use some snare within the entry chamber to cut the, this huge nucleus into smaller piece. You can take out piece by piece or even you can use other equipment even to cut the nucleus, do a good vitrectomy then put the lens within the sulcus. This is very important to convert. PC tear and retain nucleus material to continue the fake though, once again, depending upon the type of nucleus remaining. Always this is very important, always reduce the flow rate, decrease the value, lower the infusion bottle to prevent increasing pressure to the entry chamber. Always to remove the cortex, always I prefer to do a bimanual technique. See, this is a case I'm showing you with the patient with the posterior polar cataract. You could be able to see that there is already rent has been noted. Already we know that PPC chances of rent is always there. So when you notice there is length, so always take out the uh, dialer from the side port, push a dispersive viscoelastic, then you remove the FACO probe, then bimanual irrigation definitely help you to take out all this cortical matter. You can see that the rent is not extending. In such cases, you can put a IOL in the sulcus with the optic capture. So setting for anterior vitrectomy, very important, maximal possible setting, lowest vacuum, lowest flow rate, irrigation bottle height has to be around 80 to 100 centimeter. This is about the few setting for anterior vitrectomy technique. Always with the infusion lines, always I do a vitrectomy through the side port. Always pull the vitreous in the anterior chamber down to the vitreous tip until no more vitreous in the anterior chamber. You can put a triumphal loan, make sure that there is no vitreous in the uh, yes, this is a, now most of our friends, those who are good retina surgeon, if they, they're also a good FACO surgeon. Now, like this has been described by our friend, Dr. Abhay Aswada, he go through the pars planar. He make a pars planar entry, 
take the vitrectomy cutter to the pars plana if you do a pars plana vitrectomy normally the amount of pressure what you are going to put through a anterior vitrectomy through a open method much lesser compared to the pars plana vitrectomy you can able to see how well ac is forming then if you want to do a posterior capsular access also you can do and you can put the lens even in the bag also if you are confident of putting it in the bag so these are the options available if you got a rent some of sometimes we even in our olden days we never used to put a lenses but most of us now we switch on to this clear fixated iol or glued iols so iol in the bag if the rent is very small iol in the sulcus if you think that if the rent is big you can put the lens in the sulcus but make sure that you put a pilocarpin in end of the surgery then in excess damage to the capsular zonules you can do this technique uh, iris clip lenses why i am showing you this video most of us i think our been having this training center it could able to see a lot of friends by our resi junior resident i think if you good in this iris claw technique one of the best lens to put i think always put the viscoelastic normally lens you go under first put it over the iris put a sufficient amount of viscoelastic in the anterior chamber glue then with the help of a special forces which has been provided by the company or you can order from the company you can hold the lens then i think how well the lens is staying make sure that the positioning of the lens is very important hold it go from the paracentesis go underneath the iris click i think then you can the iris will clip under the behind the iris so final vitrectomy closure very very important but one fine point i want to tell whenever there is a rent make sure that you do a good vitrectomy and one suture has to be put in the end of the surgery you can remove that suture after 15 days roll off posterior segment if you think that you cannot manage it, no ego immediately you refer them to posterior segment surgeon in conclusion the incidence of posterior capsular rent can be significantly decreased by identifying the presence of predisposing factor and appropriate modification of the surgical plan early recognition and treatment of the capsular tear vitreous loss help in prevent serious complication and improve post operative outcomes complication do happen in the best of the hands but the true competence of a surgeon is judged by patient thank you one and all yeah very nice dr krishna very nice madam unmute Oh, it's a mine is unmute only. You can't hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear me? Yes, 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 yes. We can hear you. We can hear you. Can hear you. One thing to all your uh, uh, videos. Whenever you are doing that, uh, bringing out the nucleus out. You, in the last video, you shown uh, trocar uh, maintainer, which is called yeah. uh, behind the limbus. Yeah, madam. Yeah, madam. And other things you can also use the same trocar trocar into the is anterior chamber because in these situation. you always need fluid in the anterior chamber so make sure that there is fluid in the anterior chamber as you correctly said you can in so many uh, instances your iol scaffold of uh, dr amar is uh, help us a lot when the nucleus oh. is big and uh, if you are not able to manage the nucleus because easily you can do a phaco emulsification instead of even in that sics case which you showed where the cornea was enlarged and so many sutures are put i would have preferred to do a iol scaffold in this cases otherwise all your points are very correct pars plana vitrectomy what avasavda said is a correct thing even when you are doing a bimanual vitrectomy see to it that your third port is anterior chamber maintainer because fluid is an essential part of any anterior vitrectomy because uh, and through the side port you may not get enough fluid inside the eye if uh, mohan wants to add anything to this please go no, ahead i think it's a beautiful talk and uh, i would personally suture all the ports yeah i would even if uh, the, the not only the main port but also the two side ports because the incidence of end of thalmitis is goes up by about four to five times when you have a vitreous loss and a pcr so that's one important thing other, all other things are very, always manage the vitreous first and then manage the nucleus or the epinucleus or the cortex that's uh, again another important thing so use tricord when you have pcr use tricord manage the vitreous first do a bimanual vitrectomy either a limbal or a pars plana whatever you are comfortable with and then go ahead Uh, atya if uh, i have a tnoe webinar at 11 o'clock okay. after lagane can you go yes yes after yes. lagane yes yes you can you can go ahead no problem dr lahan no no sir so you can go ahead now also go ahead now thank you thank you thank you ragini lagane sir thank you i'll morning, try morning sir ramu good morning good morning good morning ramu morning. 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 welcome sir ramu welcome good morning very good morning good morning ramu bhaiya 
very good morning atya you want to say one or two words about me <laughs> yeah so one or two words not enough <laughs> so you are the greatest guy the winner of so many opls no no a warm loving brother a great surgeon a great scientist so much community work and uh, you know we i think all of us sitting here today are one family and i am really blessed to have you all in my life thank you and and and, and, and uh, mohan next yes. year eiw is vice president thank you sir thank you sir all your blessings sir uh, i am going to talk to you about uh, the anapi patient after cataract surgery many of us have uh, gone uh, come across this uh, situation where the patient is having 66 and 6 vision as you know the son is sitting on the old mindset of cataract surgery we used to have this old uh, mature cataract modern nowadays patients are coming with 6966 6, and you have to it's like a plastic surgery patient or a luxury consumer where you need to give them very good vision quality of vision good vision at distance intermediate near as well changing profile of the cataract patient younger active the more importantly they are aware educated aware hugely aware of the options new possibilities and highly demanding demand lifestyle changes as well i'm going to show you one 57 year old uh, male the refractive multifocal done long time back 2003 if i'm right i think the resume patient having 65 n6 vision patient not happy the problem is a glare and halo as you can see perfectly centered lens a beautiful uh, uh, just like a femto rex as it is but the patient is not very happy the halos are on headlights starbucks are on headlights the photic phenomenon was significant for this patient the patient was very in uh, anabi she went to the court and uh, uh, of course she lost the uh, case but the problem is you need to counsel these patients even if you multifocal of course the uh, the newer multifocals the extended depth of lenses all these the photic phenomenon much much less but still there is a problem you need to counsel the patient very significant other patient can be anabi this is a patient who had uh, what do you call a crack on the lens i should have actually experienced i thought it will go away but the crack uh, persisted the patient had polyopia and uh, no starburst and because right it, it is there in the right in the visual axis and this patient also very very unhappy and i had to explant the lens and put another lens as well again multifocal restore lens notice they are not using a uh, restore but this patient is uh, complaining of misty vision you can see here this is because of the glistening on the left surface of the lens the things on the surface lens which is causing this problem in these patients you can see here this glistening can reduce the contrast sensitivity and uh, very common with the uh, acris of lenses uh, um, not uh, with other lenses but very common the acris of lens you can see the glistening on the surface of the lens which decreases the contrast sensitivity and also the night vision especially for the multifocal patients there is already a 25% reduction in the contrast sensitivity with the multifocal lenses case 3 you can see a multifocal eye well patient is having 66 n6 patient complains of decrease in the contrast okay and if you notice there is only a thin line on the posterior capsule okay in a multifocal lens please understand even a wrinkle on the posterior capsule can decrease the contrast sensitivity significantly and you know once you do a yard laser for this patient you can see once you do a yard laser the patient became very happy and of course uh, the vision was very good but the contrast vision also improved because of the multifocal lenses make sure the the yard you do the yard laser much earlier than normal even a wrinkle on the posterior capsule can affect the contrast vision significantly again a case four uh, uh, 60 year old female monofocal eye well vision of 66 n6 patient not happy but the patient typically said that you know immediately after the surgery i was very happy the vision was very good but after two weeks i am not able to see very well that's what the patient says but if you look at the anterior segment it is quite normal posterior segment clinically it's also normal always do a oct when you do a oct you can see there's a cme a subtle cme which can be missed by a clinical examination either by a 90 diopter or a 78 diopter whatever it is the oct can pick it up so once you put the patient on nsaids and, uh, and the topical steroids and the patient became all right and patient became happy as well multifocal lens again phase five ou thickness lens uh, thickness multifocal 612 in need patient not happy because there is a residual astigmatism 1.5 cylinder and two cylinder in the left eye okay if you give residual astigmatism these patients are not happy so make sure that your the incision is correct probably this patient should have required a multifocal toric lens which is completely missed probably and, and, and this patient again is 
Again, case seats, you can see a six-year-old female, technique multifocal, and 24 diopters I put in the right eye, and 24.5 in the left eye, and you can see this patient, again, very, very unhappy. You can see the post-operative refraction, plus 2.5 in the right eye, and plus 2 in the left eye. If you make them hyperopic, if you make them myopic, they will just uh, not, uh, they may just harass you, but if you make them hyperopic, because if you make them hyperopic, they are not able to see. Distance, intermediate, near as well, they will literally bury you. Okay? And that is what has happened to this patient. What is the reason for this patient? This patient had asteroid halosis in both eyes. Okay? This is probably, a, because I discussed this with the uh, Tamil mascot, I mean, in as well. Okay? Probably a contraindication for a multifocal as well. Dense asteroid halosis. Though the macula was normal preoperatively, but the problem is that asteroid analysis alters the refractive index of the lens. And probably you're not able to get the power of the lens properly. And that is the reason. Because I did an IOL master, lens star, immersion, A scan. All of them showed um, preoperatively as post the same power, but the, still the patient, I have to explain the lens. K7, again, a crystal lens used to use a lot of crystal lenses. Patient not happy for this. Because suddenly what happens is the crystal lens can move forward and torque, that is twist. That is called the Z syndrome. And this is what happened. There can be a myopic shift. And uh, this patient, I have to explain the lens as well. Again, another patient with the refractive multifocal, because of the capsular phimosis, the multifocal lenses, when there is a huge rexis, a little larger rexis, the lenses can meet, move forward. When they move forward, there can be a myopic shift. But when there's a capsular phimosis, the lenses can move backward. And this patient had a hyperopic shift. And once I did the, uh, what do you call the YAG laser, to take care of the capsular phimosis, the patient, uh, the, uh, the lens started uh, unfolding inside the eye and the patient became better. Again, a multifocal eye oil, vision 6.6, 6, N6, patient not happy. In the previous session, we were discussing about this because ocular surface issues, severe dry eye, blepharitis, and one of the reasons for the patient not happy is you are not taking care of the uh, what you call the ocular surface prior to surgery and that is what is happening and once you give them lubricants and uh, did some uh, what you call um, uh, take a took care of the lid margin problem the patient became happy as well again another patient symphony ou 65 and 6 patient not happy the reason for that is the negative dysphotopsia i mean, the negative dysphotopsia is something which is really bothering all of us nowadays especially with the square edge lenses and it affects only uh, um, uh, occurs only when there's a perfect surgery and you can see uh, this patient underwent a negative dysphotopsia and uh, this patient is a gynecologist and uh, I, I said, you have the other eye done, it will disappear. The other eye also, she had a negative dysphotopsia like this. She had two rings, but what happens is, I, I usually tell them to wait for about six to eight months and fortunately for us, you know, her husband had some other problem and she got engaged in that problem and she forgot about this negative uh, dysphotopsia, dysphotopsia totally and I uh, had to uh, otherwise, it's a very difficult problem to treat as well. So, okay, case 11 is the restore lens, 618 N6. Again, you can see the post-operative refraction. Pre-operatively, the keratometry was 45, 44.25. You can see the post-operatively, I'm sorry, the post-operatively is about uh, the, the, the keratometry is not relieving much cylinder. But the, uh, uh, but the post-operative refraction is coming like this. The reason for that, probably there's a post corneal elastic medicine which you are Increasing or the lens tilt is probably the reason. I did an eye trace and the patient, uh, 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 they were, it was perfectly normal as well. Again, both eyes, cataract surgery done in one month interval. One eye was done by me. The other eye was done by one of my assistants and uh, my fellows or uh, my uh, uh, junior consultants. And it took a little more, a longer time, about 15 minutes for the surgery. So the functional overlay is also there. So he said, the right eye, which are done by you, is perfectly fine. The left eye, it took longer time. That is why I'm not able to see. So the functional overlay is also there. The take-home messages are very, very important. Unhappy patient look for residual refractive error. This is very, very important. PCO, I'm not talking about PCO means Elschnick spurs. Even a wrinkle on the posterior capsule or a fold on the posterior capsule. CME, always do a OCT. You can miss a CME even if the patient has got 6-5 and 5 vision. So... Dry eye, ocular surface, look at the ocular setting. Decrease contrast because of glistenings. That's uh, another important thing. Lens tilt, you have to take care and do, always do an eye trace, pre-operatively, post-operatively. And of course, keep the functional overlay as an important factor as the last as the waste paper basket diagnosis. <laughs>
So this is a happy patient, and that's what we want at the end of it. So the patient having a good thing, take care of the uh, all the parameters very strictly, pre-operatively, intra-operatively, as well as post-operatively as well. Thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity for the moment. Thank you, Mohan. Thanks, Mohan. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any experience with the LRIs when whenever you have a residual astigmatism? Yeah. I, I'm doing LRIs. I'm using the, uh, uh, what do you call, the femto catalyst for the LRI. My, for my, uh, uh, for the catalyst, uh, the femto LRIs are much more reliable for me. I'm using that especially for about 1 to 1.5 1 cylinder now. So it works very Thank well. You. Yeah, Thank more you. Reliable. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Lahane, uh, can I ask? Dr. Uh, Dr. Ram Murthy, Ram Murthy has Ram joined. His presentation is, was first. So uh, let Ram Murthy go. Ram Murthy. Thank you. Good Thank morning. you so much. Thank you. Very good morning. Good morning. Very good. Morning. Very good morning, Ram Murthy. Very good morning. Good morning. Very good morning. Have my slides just seen? Yes. 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 We can see. Am I heard? My slides are seen. Yeah. Yes. yes, you are, you are, yes, you are audible okay. and your slides uh, are seen. Very good morning, uh, Professor. Wonderful. Uh, very good morning, Dr. Athiya, Professor Lahane, Professor Ragni. Truly a honor to be Not able to hear you. Uh, Ramo, your Wi-Fi is the problem. We can't hear you. Uh. Unmute your laptop. No, no, he's a, uh, I think Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is the problem. Should we go for your presentation? Yes, yes. I can go for my presentation. Please. Uh, yes. Uh, this uh, Sai, are you ready with my presentation or Ragini can do it? Okay. So, this is the uh, PECO interested, uh, interesting cases. Next. Uh, thank you, Athiya. No problem. Uh, okay. Now, this is the direct shop. Uh, that I am showing in the hard cataract. The, uh, whenever we are doing the hard cataract, we must think that in which case we can go for direct chop and in which case we should go for the trench. When there is some whiteness is seen, in that you can go for the direct chop and when you see this chop I am doing, in the chop, basically separation should be up to the center of the nucleus. If that is not up to the center of the nucleus, then the pieces, those who are attached with each other in the fibers in the posterior part, those piece, uh, fibers, they will not permit you to take the pieces out and the phaco emulsification will be difficult. And whenever you are doing it, then the uh, if you take one piece, the other piece, the sharp piece goes behind and it causes the piece tear. So always remember that the separation should be complete. Now you see, this is a, you can see the uh, case where you can see there is so much of the fibrosis of the anterior capsule. Here again, I'm doing the direct chop. You can see here the two instruments which are in the line. You see when I'm going deep and then the separate. So your FECO tip and the chopper. Chopper should go to deep and it should be a sharp chopper. Otherwise, the horizontal, this uh, vertical chop will be very difficult. And again, you rotate. Uh, and after that also, whenever you are going in deep, it should be minimum deep inside the nucleus and then the chop. So, the chopper should be sharp and then both strength what you are using on, uh, by the peco tip and the chopper should work together so that the chopping is possible in such cases. Uh, so now here again, you will see the one piece remained. It, it is taken 90 degree in front of the um, peco tip and then it is chopped. So here, every time you have seen the complete separation of the piece is made. And here you will see again the last piece, whenever I am taking that last 
fish. So here you should be very slow. Otherwise, the surge can happen, and you may land in the trouble. Now this is the another case. You can see here. I am just staining this case, and after the stain, the I will do the rexis. So whenever you are doing such type of white cataract, I use the uh, forship because what happens because of the anterior capsular calcification or fibrosis, this goes. on one side by the needle so better to go with the again you will see this i'm i have completed and again i am doing the chopping here you will see here whenever i am doing chopping the this is a softer than the previous two cases here you will see again and the chopping every time the separation tip and the pico tip these three Uh, things should be together and you can make the pieces four or six whatever is possible and if your rex is small then in such cases it is very difficult to bring the large pieces so you have to make the six pieces if you are accidentally your rex is a smaller one then you can enlarge the rex after completing your peco emulsification and here you will see i have completed the peco emulsification in the uh, the and whenever the last piece you will see i'm going very slow supported by the chopper and i still see here so that completes the peco uh, now i'm going for the small pupil you will see here the posterior synechias are there those are i'm trying to break the synechia in the case so this i am using the needle so whenever we are using the needle here we will have to also take the precautions that the anterior capsule should not be tear by the needle so whenever you are using the needle it should be on the iris side and not on the lens side so like that you can just pull the iris so that the synechia can be broken and the pupil which was very small that pupil is now enlarged and slightly semi dilated now i am making the rexis now here i have not stained it because there is a stain of the pigmentation of the iris and that is guiding me for the rexis so here you will see the rexis i am completing and then the hydro dissection i am doing here and then feco so now here again thing is i am doing the trench now here i am not doing the uh, chopping because see what happens in the chopping we use the more vacuum and that vacuum can bring the iris in the tip and in such situation once that iris comes in the tip then it is very difficult to go for the peco so it is better uh, to go uh, for the you can say trench the divide and then go for the peco emulsification so any iris uh, posterior uh, synechias uh, i think you must avoid the chopping and you can go for the stop and chop technique and that is definitely good where you can prevent the iris coming in the tip of the peco emulsification and uh, you can make small pieces or large pieces according to the how much pupil is dilated or here you can also use the uh, Uh, pupil uh, expanders and then i am removing the cortex and the lens will be implanted in that so you have seen that people are so small but just removing the synechia the now this is the last case i am showing and here the amor always helps me you can see there is a pctr and if there is no, i can see here you can see the pctr is there and the when i was doing this this was the case which was done i think maybe some 3 uh, 4 years before that time you, you can see the lens what i have implanted is not a three piece lens it is a foldable lens i have implanted uh, that time so it was to begin with but this foldable lens also works because here only the one side of the uh, this uh, posterior capsule is tear and i have impl implanted this lens in the back so the amar always helps so each and every ot as we are operating 100 150 cases every day 
so every day amari enters in our theater means minimum once so this is the case and thank you very much thank you atiya thank you everybody atiya you you are mute you are mute you are mute okay uh, since we don't have much time i just want to add one more thing you said the iris whenever you do the manual stretching and iris starts coming in the tip so what i will do is just to be on the safe side i might to have uh, spend a few seconds more i'll put iris hooks and uh, see to it that the iris does that is always better other, other yes, than yes. that you are uh, professionally you are showing the chopping and trenching and all that okay uh, ram ramu are you ready yeah, yeah i hope so can you <laughs> yes. we can now okay. hear you good morning sir very very good morning very good morning sorry okay. can you hear me now see my slides yeah, yeah yes Okay, you know i am not at home sir very good morning good morning good morning i am just transiting through some place that's why some uh, challenges but anyway but well, yeah i know you are coming back from dubai but thank you for joining thank you so much uh, professor raini professor lahane uh, and the uh, rest of the members of mos for this wonderful invitation though we are connecting virtually the feelings are always there and it's always a pleasure to be part of your great conference the topic given to me is lens based procedures and refractive surgeries and as we go along i feel that this will go more and more uh, occupy a preeminent position indications for lens removal has always been a cataract but today i think we have to start considering for grades of high emetropia especially hypropia and presbyopia also one of the primary things that we need to understand is that just because the lens is clear on the slit lamp that does not mean that a 25 year old lens and a uh, lens of a patient who is 55 years old as you can see here uh, both of them appear quite similar or functionally the same for example the, as you can see in this case the point spread function the modular type function of a 55 year old lens is much less the lens is much much thicker and the accommodation is of course lost because of which the patient requires external glasses even if he doesn't have a primary refractive error and there is a significant loss of contrast because unlike in a younger patient where the negative uh, aspericity of the lens compensate for the positive aspericity of the anterior surface of the cornea here both are positively aspheric because of which there is a significant drop in the quality of vision especially in mesopic conditions so essentially the optical consequences of a lens aging is that there is an increase in spherical aberration light scattering refractive index and size of the lens there is a drop in transparency and accommodation that's why even though the lens is not anatomically dysfunctional it is dysfunctional as far as physiological performance is concerned and thus came the concept as dysfunctional lens index and this is one of the eye trees is one of the instruments through which you can study this as you can see here the cornea is quite pristine whatever deterioration in the quality of the vision happens is because of the dysfunctional lens anything less than 5 is considered to be less and you can see here is 2.1 that also corresponds to the amount of aberrations where most of the aberrations in the total eye is contributed by the internal aberration this is a kind of patient who significantly improve once the lens is taken out not just by the quality of vision but by the quantity of vision too on the other hand if i have a patient like this where the dli is 8.24 and you can see the internal aberration is extremely small this is a kind of patient if he or she wants a correction of the refractive error still i'll try and do it on the cornea rather than take out the lens so basically the dysfunctional lens index and the concept is that it gives a objective measurement of the lens dysfunction taking into consideration internal aberrations contrast sensitivity pupil dynamics where even though anatomically it doesn't appear like a cataract the lens acts like a cataract and might the patient might benefit by taking it out one of the most challenging surgeries even though it might appear easy to perform is a clear lens extraction especially for correcting refractive errors because the uh, expectations of these patients are extremely high so you have to make sure that the ocular surface is optimal 
use a formula which would give you repeatable results. For me, it's a Barrett toric and a Barrett universal two combination. Do a topography to make sure the cornea is regular. Abrometry, as I showed, is important. Making sure the retina is pristine, making the corneal endothelium is good. And you, you should be able to repeat, get repeatable confident results as far as surgical outcomes are concerned uh, and your refractive outcomes are concerned. When there are no abrasions of the cornea in a situation like this, these are the cases which are most suitable for undergoing a clear lens extraction. But if you have a significant corneal abrasions as in this situation and the internal abrasions are less, then removal of the lenses per se may not help. And these cases, you have to tell the patients, even though you might be removing the lens for correcting the refractive error, the quality of vision may not be that great. So who are the patients who are um, I consider as the uh, classical cases for a um, clear lens extraction or a relax procedure? They're usually in the 50s, hypropic patients, especially 2.3 diopters. Otherwise, normal eye, as I showed you already, all the other parameters have to be normal. And especially if they have a shallow anterior chamber, which predisposes the angle closure glaucoma, instead of you doing a laser hydrotomy, removing the lens itself will create adequate space. At the same time, take care of the quality and quantity of vision. And many of these patients, even though they are in the 50s or even early 60s, are highly motivated for freedom glass, glasses. So doing the uh, lens surgery a little before the onset of cataract does help them. And in case their expectations are extremely high, we all know the limitations of multifocal and trochal lenses. These are patients we might stay away from. Uh, just to show you one of the surgeries that's being performed, here I am using a EDOF lenses. Today, I have almost completely switched over to trifocal and synergy lenses in these situations. And that lens has been, because it's a uh, almost a clear lens, no segment, only segmentation has been done. Using gentle parameters, the lens has been removed and you can see the intraocular lens has been implanted. Uh, if in case you're, in case you're doing your surgery, with the, uh, without the use of the laser again, it's extremely possible. In these cases, I use a, a fairly high vacuum, keep it at around 600, keep the intraocular pressure as 20, frag, you know, virtually phaco aspirate the lens, and then subsequently implant the lens of my choice, which is more often the trifocal lens in these cases today. So I always do the second eye surgery. It's a, the surgery has always to be bilateral, uh, at least giving an interval of two weeks. It's not just an evaluation done by my optometrist, but we also do a clearly clinical evaluation of the patient, evaluate their in, um, expect, whether the expectations are met and what exactly is their comfort level, looking at their computers, looking at their driving for reading. Depending on that, we might titrate the part of the lens that's being implanted in the second eye or even change the type of lens that's being implanted. But having said that, today with the versatility of the trifocal lenses, it becoming less and less of a problem. Again, whenever there is an issue and the patient is not uh, quite happy with the surgical outcome, giving a period of about three months, if the patient is bothered by the surgical outcome, even after the second eye uh, surgery, we do not hesitate to go ahead and do, the, uh, do a touch-up procedure. Usually it's a PRK procedure on the surface of the cornea. Once it is done, it's not just a requirement for glasses, but the quality of vision also in, improves quite significantly. And since these are usually sm small errors, doing a surface ablation does help. And I, I always use mitomycin C. Usually in a week's time or so, these patients recover quite well. So just a very small study that we did. And this was in the year 2019. In 21, we are doing a lot more of these patients, but I have not analyzed these patients. We did 28 eyes bilaterally, 14 patients. As you can see, the mean age is around 50. Hypropia is most predominant, uh, 13 patients. Just one eye for one patient for a small degree of myopia. And as you can see here, in that time, I had bifocals, EDOPS, and trifocals combination. But today, it will be largely trifocals. And uh, the pre-op refractive error was ranged right from uh, plus 0.75 to plus 6 doctors. And the post-op refractive error, as you can see, we are almost able to hit the bullseye in all these cases, especially because of optical biometry and usage of the Barrett formula. As far as the visual outcome itself is concerned, most often these patients achieve total spectacle independence. And we had two patients of uh, two eyes of a EDOF patient where 
the visual acuity for NIA was 2032, and two eyes of multifocal intraocular lenses, the diffractive multifocals were 2032 as far as intermediate vision is concerned. But since the other eye had a reasonably good uh, vision, none of these patients actually required glasses. So in case, uh, nowadays we are also coming across patients where a monofocal implant in the first eye, want a bifocal or a trifocal in the other eye, we go ahead and implant that. In the case, in case the patient wants a secondary implantation of a trifocal lens, that is again possible in these situations. As you can see, this is an Indian uh, piggyback lens that is available at a reasonable cost. And you can not only deal with the, uh, any residual refractive error, but also introduce multifocality in these situations. Suffice it to say, I think lens-based approach for correcting refractive errors, especially hypropias in patients in beyond 45, is going to be an effective procedure that we will be doing more and more often. Careful counseling, meticulous evaluation, flawless surgeries often lead on to satisfied patients. I know that this is a fairly simple topic that I'm talking about. I think it's a procedure of the future, and we might be doing this uh, you know, quite frequently in our surgical lifetime. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Was it heard? Yeah, very nice. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not at all an important, an unimportant topic. It's a very important topic, as you correctly said. Nowadays, uh, there's a refractive procedure, a refractive lens exchange it become very, very important, especially for the hyperopes as you're talking about. So it is a very nice presentation. Very good morning to Dr. Keki Mehta, sir. Good morning, How good morning. How are you, sir? I'm fine, if perfect. If you add anything to the presentation of Ram Murthy, I'll be very, very glad. Always you have very... Nothing to add to Ram Murthy. He's always the last word on everything. <laughs> okay. So... Since I, we don't have time, we'll go to the last presentation. Last two presentation. Oh, I'm seeing Dr. Jeevan also here. Okay. Yeah, just try it. Yeah. Dr. Harbin, yeah. Dr. Harbin post RK. Uh, yeah, yeah. Patients. So, can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Yes. So, uh, I thank uh, Professor Lane and Dr. Lagni Parikh for making me the part of this wonderful conference, very well organized. So, the my talk is post RK cataract surgery. So how the RK works is uh, because many of the young ophthalmologists may not know that we used to give a paracentral incision and with the intraocular pressure, there was a paracentral steepening. It was pushed out and there was a central flattening. And the, there has been a lot of studies which show that the hypropic shift keeps on taking place in these patients over the period of time. The challenges when we are doing cataract surgeries are primarily preoperative in calculation of the biometry than operative post operative. So, the preoperatively, the toughest part is the getting the right keratometry and biometry. And maximum flattening is in the center, while we measure paracentral, which is much steeper with most of the equipments. Cornea is irregular with a wide variation in the reading. Optical biometer has got, uh, say, my uh, lowest keratometric reading it can take is 34 uh, diopter, maybe 32 diopter or 30 diopter. Yeah. And some yeah. of them may be so they, they pass And there may be actasia with a very high keratometric value. So, whenever we are calculating or doing the biometry, we need to take the flattest reading given by the, any of the equipments. And we need to understand that the one diopter of error in the corneal, you know, this thing make a IUL change by one diopter. So we calculate on IOL calc at dot ASCRS org, which gives us an optical biometer reading Pentacam, Barrett, minimum average and maximum. So toric IOL, whether to use or not, will depend upon the type of data we have got. So operatively, there is not much. I, I'll come to straight away what power to use. I'll just show you some of the cases. This is 51-year-old male with the prior history of RK 15 years back, had heart cataract both eyes. His best cataract vision was 612. His subjective fraction on minus 4, minus 3.5, and 170. And once we did the biometry, we can see that the IUL power we were getting was 13.5, and the keratometry average was 37.49. But on a pentacan, the keratometry was 39. 
So once we did the target refraction zero, the maximum we got was 13.56, which was matching with the optical biometer because the optical biometer was flatter than the pentagon. And I always target minus one. And in this case, then so far as the cylinder was concerned, there was a very good agreement on the refraction, which was minus 3.5 at 80 degree. Lens star reading was 25, axis pentagon was 82, so the excellent uh, agreement. So we have to, we can go for the toric chiral correction. So we use the ZCT 525, which will give 3.5 correction with the 15 diopter of IUL instead of 13.5, because we targeted for minus one reflection, which we had an excellent result. So I always target minus one at least. This is the another patient. And if you see that the cylindrical power was over here 6.25 diopter, but axis was 172. And on a pentagram, the axis was cylindrical power was the same, but axis was 149. So there's a lot of variation in the axis of the two. And then if you see the biometry value was 21 diopter, if you put on a minus one, maximum we was getting was 29 diopter. So there's a huge variation. And we need to go by this reading instead of this 21 reading. Otherwise, you will land up with a lot of hypropia. So what are your power and what next? We went for 29 diopter. And then we saw the refractive error or the acceptance of the glasses, which was 164, 165. So whenever the cornea is irregular, the refractive error becomes more important than the keratometric value. And we implanted the lens at 165 degree, neither at 172 nor at 149, according to the refractive acceptance and with the minus one and the highest reading getting 29 diopter. This is the another case planned for a cataract surgery. You can see the keratometric value is 46.80, which is very unlikely. And the power which we were getting was 10.5. So because that means there's somewhere this ectasia is coming into place. We did the IUL calc and we planned for, though the maximum was coming 11.52 with minus one targeted reflection, we still went for 12.5 and we landed up with gross hypropia and the final acceptance of the glass was plus nine with 4.5 diopter. So you can see the how much, because the area which was 46 coming over there was the keratometry of the uh, this thing, actatic area on both the equipments. So then we removed the lens and we went for 27 after IUL exchange. And then post operative the patient was slightly hypropic. So there was another patient who's uh, on the IUL calc. When we did the calculation, the readings were coming from plus two to minus six on a various formulas. And according to me, no patient is going to have such a low. Most of these patients need around 26, 28, 24 after because of the flattening of the cornea. So we just planned for the secondary IUL implantation. After removal of the cataract, patient acceptance was plus 13 after a secondary IUL implantation of 26 after was done. So lesson learned, and this is the, we need to take the flattest keratometric value, whatever we are getting. Target reflection should be minus 0.5, minus 2. Any keratometric value above 40, you are doing a paracentral. There is no doubt about it. Any biometric value below 18, cross check everything. Until this patient is using the minus glasses, if it is a slightly hypopic, that means there is absolutely wrong reading. And most of these patients will have the IUL power needed between 24 to 28 after. So this we can prove an IOL exchange and a secondary IOL implant is always an option. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lane and Dr. Ragni once again and Maharashtra Optimic Society for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We'll thank you, Dr. Arban. Uh, yeah. Because we are running short of time. I can't see it, uh, Dr. Titial here. Jivan? Jivan is not here. No, Jivan was high. Yes, he is there. Jivan, go ahead. I'll just, just share my screen now. Yes, please, sir. Yes, sir. We have to hurry up. Yes. Uh, thank you for a kind invitation, uh, Dr. Lahane, sir. And uh, I wish you all the best for an uh, entire session. I'll just run my video, which is for uh, seven and a half minutes. Looking into an uh, intraoperative OCT or an OCT in a uh, pre-op preparation, is always is uh, going to help us in deciding the type of cataract we're dealing with and what type of surgery we're going to do subsequently in those cases. 
And intraposity does give you a assessment of the steps you're going to take and the dynamicity of each step can be checked. So it's a very high resolution imaging which you can acquire during your uh, surgery intraoperatively with uh, intraop OCT microscopes. Definitely is going to enhance your understanding and it can give you all the pictures. Like you see here, uh, it can give you incision. It can give you the dynamicity of after you puncture the capsule. It can give you the assessment of uh, depth of delineation and this uh, hydro dissection also. It can also help you in the uh, nucleus uh, emulsification by knowing the depth of uh, your initial trench. It can also give you assessment. So this is what uh, anterior segment assessment can be done on the table. This is the RK patient. You can see, uh, you can judge the entire curvature of cornea as well as the scar which is there. And uh, sometimes in a post-BR surgery, silicon-filled eyes, you may not be able to see, but if you're OCT, you know that the entire corneal endothelium is, you know, with the silicon oil filled with the silicon oil. This is a case where you have hardly any chamber, very extremely shallow entry chamber. You can assess the entire length of uh, sinica also. Post-traumatic cataracts, uh, you know the depth of uh, opacity also nuclear or deeper. Sometimes the injury in the posterior capsule can be picked up like in this patient post-injection. And in a posterior polar cataracts gives you a morphology. Incision-wise, uh, it helps you to see what type of incision we have made. This is a uniplanar incision. To begin with, you can have a biplanar or triplanar incision that can be assessed very clearly. This is a biplanar incision uh, done by keratome. Femtosecond, you can see a three planar incision. And after surgery also, you can assess the incisions also. It is very helpful in uh, capsular access, especially in uh, cases where you can't see very, very clearly. This particular case, things are clearly visible. Sometimes if you miss the flap, a flap can be picked up in an IOCT microscope also. But it's very important uh, tool in cases of uh, intumescent white cat. You can see here, entire uh, hydrated cortex is bulging out. There's a chance of a radial extension. You might do a small rexis, aspirate, make sure the entire, uh, you can say dome is now flattened. It has become more convex than a concave. Subsequently, with the release pressure, you can do a rexis now. You know, milky cataract also, sometimes you don't see what is behind the milk that can be picked up by the OCT microscopes. And subsequently, you fill up the uh, bag with the viscoelastic and the rexis can be completed. So this visualization does help in a, doing a, a proper guided uh, capsular axis also. Other important area is hydro dissection and delineation, which is normally we don't see the uh, three-dimensional picture, which is only possible by IOCT. Like you can see here, we have done a hydro dissection just by uh, looking at a fluid wave and the anterior displacement of the lens diaphragm doesn't tell you exactly what has happened. So here we are trying to do a delineation uh, delineation also, you can have a just picture of a ring tells you that delineation has happened, but you don't know how much fluid you have injected. If you see the IOCT here, it gives you a picture of a multiple delineation as well as a dissection happening. Sometimes, like in this case, I'm doing a hydro dissection of posterior polar, a gentle. You can see how much is the extension of uh, entire capsular bag from the epicortex. So that you can know and you have to do a decompression to decrease the pressure onto the posterior capsule. So this is the importance of uh, seeing what is happening during your hydro procedure. Here, we already have a hydro uh, delineation here. Decompression decreases the, uh, the volume of a fluid. And subsequently, when you do a hydro dissection, again, you see the fluid is filling in a, both the areas, delineated as well as the dissected area. So in cases where your posterior capsule is weak, this is, can be titrated also. An immediate decompression will help in these cases. This is again a posterior polar cataract. We are doing a delineation first. You can see one delineation. This is what has happened. The epicortical cushion can be customized as per the delineation here. Or we can know that what has happened in this particular case, we are doing a dissection also together the delineation. Nucleotomy also is quite helpful for beginners. You can know how deep your trench. Just seeing the glow doesn't help sometimes, especially in a, a clear uh, media. The depth can be assessed by looking onto the, the deep concavity, which is convexity, which has happened with your trenching also. It tells you how much of a tissue is also left uh, underneath the, your trench. So you can 
avoid damage to epicortical cushion or a damage to posterior capsule during nephrotomy also and throughout your surgery you can see that your cushion is uh, available or it is retained if your cushion comes out you can uh, also assess the posterior capsule very clearly in these cases of uh, difficult case scenarios especially the posterior polar cataract you can see here that entire now i'm trying to take out epicortical cushion layer by layer and at this time also this is a cushion i can see and uh, i can see the posterior capsule also so this also gives you a, a relieving that you are not uh, playing with the posterior capsule you have an intact posterior capsule there and subsequently you can see trying to take out the epicortex in bulk and uh, that saves the posterior capsule in, in difficult case scenarios you can see clear intact posterior capsule ioct this is helpful in uh, deep chambers especially a high myopic patients or where you have a loose back also implantation iol can be safely done as it but sometimes the extent uh, the depth of iol the till can be also appreciated by ioct here so this is a distortion of a wound which happens with the iol injection the various iol injection techniques can be compared by looking into the distortion of a wound which has happened in these cases viscoelastic removal is simpler it normally doesn't require any assessment but towards the end it is very important to know in cases where you have a little bit of a disturbance in a incision area and a high risk high category cases where you can have a desmal normal detachment can be picked up during this stage also because after hydration very difficult to see what is happening underneath the incision area like this but if you see oct there's a little bit of dis disturbance in a desmal area therefore it is important to hydrate or increase the pressure from the side port rather than playing for the main wound because that can increase the your detachment so sometimes you may have to inject uh, air or a gas to tamponade this large detachment which has happened and this is only possible by ioct it gives you a real time assessment of entire uh, surgical scenario so i would say ioct is uh, helpful it also complements the pre op uh, anti segment oct which you have done to assess the type of cataract in your cases so if people have access to ioct definitely that's going to help their surgical acumen and the steps will they can do thank you for your kind listening and giving me the opportunity and time towards the end of session because i was engaged with the uh, other session and a workshop in rp center as such thank you thank, thank you lahane sir for uh, ragini lahane thank you very much well, sir thank you very much you. I, i was knowing you have got workshop there and still you have joined thank you very much sir thank you arbans thank you, uh, you uh, uh, ramamurthy thank you uh, uh, madam uh, yes. thank you very much acha ma'am thank you, you very much for problem. conducting it was my honor yes nicely the session it was my honor to be here yes yes thank you thank you, thank you sir. okay now ma'am you can uh, just uh, say few words and we can end the session acha ma'am yes it was a wonderful meeting on a sunday morning though personally i would not have liked it but i enjoyed because <laughs> it is an invitation from ragini and you sir so i cannot say no and after a long time i'm seeing faces like dr kk mehta dr harbans dr jeevan tetial yourself and ragini we just met and it was my honor to be here and i learned so many new things the last lecture was wonderful of uh, oct which uh, Uh, dr jeevan said and everybody uh, was wonderful today thank you very much once thank again. you ma'am thank, thank you ma'am for being with us and thank you so much ma